Welcome to the Lifehouse Church Podcast. More information about Lifehouse and our senior pastors, Richard and Helen Kabakian, can be found at lifehouse.com.au. We hope you enjoy the following message. A few years ago now, I had the privilege of being able to go and speak to our kids' world. And uh, I think we were in Glenroy at the time. And uh, I got to go in there and, and just talk to them about Jesus, and, and, which was great. I love doing that. And uh, so what I did this particular day is that I'm, no, I'm not a real good cook as such, but what I thought I would do is I would teach them how to make uh, one of my... Uh, the secret recipes that have kind of been handed on down through the family. And actually, this one came from Kathy's mum. And it's making choc mint biscuits. And so I thought, this would be so cool. We can do this. And so we got the ingredients there. We got some flour and some butter. And I don't know, what else do you put in these things? Eggs. We put some eggs in there as well. And uh, I said to the kids, what we're going to do is we're also going to have, a, there's a very special ingredient that goes into making these biscuits. Uh, and this is what sets it apart from any other chocolate mint biscuit that you might taste. And uh, so it's a secret ingredient, kids, all right? Secret. Don't be going home telling your parents about this recipe because this is secret. I'm just sharing it with you because I think you're awesome. So we did that. And uh, so we got there and I said, this is the secret. Under the bench, I pull out this tube of Colgate toothpaste. And this is the secret minty ingredient that's going to go into these biscuits, that's going to make them minty fresh. And I'll tell you what, when you have these biscuits, you won't need to brush your teeth afterwards because it's all baked into there. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. So we get the eggs and we get the flour. We start mixing and making these things and everything, which is all going well. Uh, And the kids are looking at me like, really? You're going to put toothpaste in a biscuit? Really? Uh, We've got some very smart kids here at Lifehouse Church. And they're looking me up and down thinking, Pastor Joseph, you've really lost it. You're going to put, I'm saying, no, 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 no. This is a secret ingredient. And look, I'll prove it. So I got on the phone, pretend phone, to my wife. And and I'm talking to her saying, hey, Kath, you know that recipe that your mum gave you about chocolate mint biscuits. Um, I'm doing it with the kids and, and they don't believe me, but uh, I'm telling them about the, sorry, but the secret ingredient that goes into this thing and, and that it's toothpaste. And, and then I'm going, oh, what? Oh, 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 okay. And meanwhile, all these kids have just, they've gotten all the eggs and the flour and everything's all set up. And I'd said to this one little kid, uh, I can't remember who he is and I'm not gonna even try to, uh, try and say his name in case now he's in youth and he's in the room. Um, But he was one of those kids who thinks he knows everything. Um, And right now you're probably all imagining people who potentially this could be. I'm I'm not trying very much to avoid this section over here right now. Um, And he just pretty much thought he knew everything. And so he was there as my helper. So I just said, okay, if you're going to be like that, you can come be my helper. So I got him to help me with the eggs and the flour and everything. But I gave him the tube of toothpaste. And I said, what you need to do is you need to squeeze out the toothpaste and put it onto this plate for me. And so he's there squeezing out this toothpaste and putting it all onto a plate. And he's got it all there. And I'm on the phone to, pretend phone, to Kath. And I'm talking to her. And I'm saying, you know, about this. And then I had to say, hang on a tick. Hang on a tick. Uh, actually, I got it wrong. There's no toothpaste in these biscuits. Um, and Kat's actually getting quite angry with me right now on the phone because we're on a budget. And I, I've just wasted a whole tube of toothpaste uh, here. I can't do that. If I go home with an empty tube of toothpaste, I'm actually going to get into a lot of trouble. You guys need to help me out. So you with the toothpaste. Um, <laughs> you with the toothpaste that's there. I need you now to get all that toothpaste and put it back in the tube for me. And so he's looking at me and I'm going, yeah, come on, I need you to do this. I'm going to be in so much trouble if you don't take that toothpaste and put it back into the tube. And so he's there and mate, 100% effort. He's there getting it onto his hands and trying to stuff it back in and squeezing it through and he's he's doing all this stuff and he's there and I'm going, come on, please, come on. I'm going to be on the couch for a week if you don't get this toothpaste back into the tube. And he's there trying to squash it in and squeeze it down and everything else. And then finally, it's almost like he's breaking down in tears and he goes, oh, Pastor Joseph, I can't do it. I can't do it. And I'm just looking at him going, yeah, that's right. You can't do it. And, And toothpaste... It's just like our words. Once they're out, you can't put them back in. You can't do that. You know, the, the Bible says this, is that the power of life and death are in our tongue. So in other words, in your mouth, 
you have the ability, using your words, to actually elevate somebody and build them up, or you've got the ability to pull them down and totally destroy them. That's uh, an ability God has given to each and every one of us. And we started thinking about that, and I thought, well, can you imagine then when Jesus was on this earth, just the power that were in his words and the power that was in his tongue and how he used his words and what he did with his words. And and we started thinking about that a little bit. And as a staff, as pastoral team, we're going to be doing a series starting today. And we're going to be looking at some of the words that Jesus actually spoke and, and what that means for us. If we actually took those words and we applied them to our life, And we lived out of those words that Jesus said. And we repeated those words and we spoke those words. I wonder what impact that would have, not only on our lives as individuals, but on our community, on our street, in our families, in our schools, in our universities, in our workplaces, no matter where we went. I wonder what impact those words can have on the people that are around about us. And if your Bible is like my Bible, it's really easy to find the words of Jesus simply because someone's actually gone in and colored them all in for us. They're all in red. Uh, I don't know if your Bible is like that, but mine's like that. So if I just look at the words that are written in red, I tell you what, they can start to do some good to my life. So over the next few weeks, you're going to hear from a few different ones of us to just be able to share some of the verses and some of the words that Jesus has spoken. But today, I get to, to lay a foundation from where we go from there. So if you've got your Bibles there, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 13. And I'm going to read from verse 10. It says this, uh, Jesus was teaching in one of the meeting places on the Sabbath. There was a woman present, so twisted and bent over with arthritis that she could not even look up. She had been afflicted with this for 18 years. Everyone say 18 years. 18 years. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and he said this to her, woman, you are free. He laid hands on her and suddenly she was standing straight and tall, giving glory to God. I love this story. I really do. I love this story. It's not just a a fable or some sort of fairy tale. These are actual events that actually took place 2,000 or so years ago. This is recorded history that this woman was actually in this situation. Jesus, the Bible says, was teaching in a synagogue. Uh, Just to kind of give you a little bit of a, a background with that. The synagogue, what would happen in those places is that somebody would come, it could be a religious leader or it could be someone from the community that could read uh, and knew scriptures and they would come and they would pick hold of a scripture and they would stand up and they would read this scripture out and then what they would do is that they would give their interpretation of this scripture. And then what would happen at the end of that, everybody that was in the room had an opportunity to kind of ask questions and and kind of see, okay, what do you mean by when you said that? And no, no, that can't be that there because this said is said over here. And they have this kind of uh, lively discussion that kind of goes on. So it was one of these days, the, the person that was reading the scripture that day happened to be Jesus. And he was in the synagogue and we don't know who else was in there with him. You can imagine that there were a crowd because the Bible said that wherever Jesus went, there were crowds and crowds of people. So much so that there were times where he had to kind of distance himself from the crowds just because there were so many people and he would go off to, to the wilderness and mountain places and things like that just to have some alone time with God. But on this particular day, I'm, I'm imagining that this room that they were in, this synagogue, would have been jam-packed full of people. And we know that there was at least one person there that day who's a woman. We don't know anything else really about her. The word that they use there, the Greek word that they use there for woman kind of infers that perhaps she was a married woman. But that's kind of all that we really know about her in that she was there, uh, she was listening to the words of Jesus. But the Bible does tell us one other thing about her is that her condition that she had, that she had had it for 18 years. That's a long time to be sick. That's a long time to actually uh, walk through a a disease, an illness, a sickness that's devastating your body. And so much so that this woman's condition, it just wasn't that she could operate and function normally. Uh, This arthritic condition that she had caused her to walk bent over. 
In other words, she would have been like crawling almost on the ground. Imagine what life would have been like for her. We don't know whether she was married uh, as such. We don't know whether she had kids. We don't know whether she was wealthy. We don't know whether she was poor. We don't know whether she had a great education or not. We don't know whether or not uh, anything, how many doctors she'd seen, how many times she'd gone to the doctor. We don't know any of the details about her life. All we do know is that she had this debilitating disease for 18 years. It caused her to to be bent over. It caused her that when she walked into a room, uh, all bent over, almost crawled into a room, uh, it would almost be like she would go in unnoticed because she was so low to the ground. You know, when I don't know what it would have been like for her to do the shopping. I don't know what it would have been like for her to go and do some of the things that we do uh, on a normal everyday sort of thing that we take for granted. I don't know what life would have been like for her like that. She would have had to walk through the dusty streets just with her knuckles kind of giving her balance on the ground and, and trying to, to keep her uh, to, so she can keep moving forward. I think we've got a kind of a picture there that we can show. She would have had to kind of walk through life like that, never looking up, never seeing the sky, never looking at some, some person in their eye when they're talking to them, never having a conversation face to face, never being able to do that because of the condition that she was in. In fact, one of the versions of the Bible says that she was unable to stand up, which meant that she probably had tried to stand up, but she was unable to do it. So she was not able to actually pick herself up. So all she saw in her vision as she was walking through life was dirt. She saw dust, she saw the ground, that's all she saw as she walked through life as best she could, all she saw was the ground in front of her. She had no ability, no, 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 uh, no strength around her life to pick herself up and to be able to look straight ahead. There was no clear direction. There was none of that that was kind of going on for her life. That physically, it would have her, her calluses and everything on her hands, she would have had cut hands uh, just from walking through city streets. They would have had all that. She would have been in a tremendous amount of pain just simply doing and trying to exist as a, as a normal person. That would have been her life for 18 years. Emotionally, you can imagine what sort of impact that would have on her self-esteem. Uh, she couldn't do some of the things that other women could do. She couldn't, she couldn't go some of the places that other women could go. You can imagine the sort of effect that that would have on her as a woman. If she was a mother, as a mother. If, if she was married, as a wife. You can imagine the sort of impact as she starts to see herself as beneath everybody's feet. As she starts to see herself as less than less. As she starts to see herself as someone who has no vision for her future because all she sees is the dirt. This was her life and this is what she was, what she was uh, down to do. And this is what it says in verse 16. We can't forget who actually did this to her. In verse 16, Jesus says this. He said, This dear woman, a daughter of Abraham, has been held in bondage by Satan for 18 years. The devil did this to her. You know, the devil is real. We can kind of think, oh yeah, whatever. The devil is real. And some of the things that we walk through and some of the things that we face in our lifetime, we need to understand that the devil's purpose and the devil's plan for your life is that he wants to come and rob, steal and destroy from your life. He wants to take away your ability to be able to stand up straight and walk through life. Instead, he wants to come and he wants to cause you to be crippled either through things that people say to you, things that people do to you, circumstances that you find yourself in. His plan and his purpose for your life is that you walk through life like that woman that you walk through life with no clear vision for the future because you can't see what's ahead because you're so bent over because of the things that you've walked through. That's his purpose and that's his, that's his plan for your life. He comes to rob, to steal and destroy. He wants us just to see the dust. Situations that we find ourselves in, he plans for those things so that they cripple us and limit us to be able to see what God has ahead and God has in store for each and every one of us. He uses condemnation, he uses guilt, He uses shame. He uses all these things to kind of keep us bound, looking at the dirt so that we can't even see what God has in store for any one of us. That's what He does. But you know, as I read the Word of God, that's not God's plan for our life. His plan for our life is that we are more than conquerors through Him who loves us. His plan isn't that we have a vision that's down here. He said, no, no, uh, His plan for our life is that no matter what we've done, no matter what we've, what's transpired in our life, no matter what circumstances have kind of come, God says, no, 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 when you come to me, that you are a new creation. All those things are all passed away. You become a brand new person. That's God's plan and God's purpose for our life. 
but the enemy wants to keep us bound and bent over so that we can't move forward. We can try and blame people for all the things that have happened to us. We can blame people for all the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And it's because of those people that I find myself here because that person said that to me or that person did that to me. But according to the Word of God, we don't battle with people. We don't battle with flesh and blood, but we battle with principalities and powers, rulers of wickedness in high places. That's who we battle with. That's, that's who we're dealing with. It's not anything else, but it's Satan that came to try and bind this lady and here she was she's been afflicted by him for 18 years and now on this particular day she finds herself in a room with Jesus and scripture says something so amazing that out of all the people that were in the room that day Jesus saw her Jesus saw her I'm sure there were other people in the room that day that had were in need of a miracle I'm sure there were other people in that room that day that had affliction, that had disease, that were in need of a touch from Jesus. Yet the Bible says Jesus doesn't mention any of those. He just sees her. Let me illustrate this for you a little bit. So this is how, if you wanted to get a picture of how a synagogue was kind of set up in those days, we kind of think there's a stage and there's someone speaking from the stage. But in those days, when you were in the synagogue, the preacher actually stood in the middle of the room. And so imagine that I'm over here a little bit in the middle of the room. And so Jesus would have been standing in the middle of our synagogue here and around Jesus were all the men. Sorry, ladies, sorry. (laughs) Around Jesus were all the men. And they would have been all bunched up in around. Some may have been seated. Some may have been standing, depending on how many were present that day. Because we know Jesus, uh, where he went, there were lots of crowds of people with him. We can assume very safely that there were a lot of people in the room that day. So around Jesus, around the speaker, were all these men everywhere. Around the perimeter of the building were these wooden seats. And on these wooden seats, that's where the women would sit. Or if there were no seats left, that's where the women would stand. And they would be all along the edges of everywhere. So you've got Jesus here. You've got all the men there. This woman, if she was there that day, which she is according to Scripture, she would have been way, 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 all the way on the perimeter of the wall. Whether she got a seat or not, she would have been here, all bent over at the ground. And the Bible says that out of all of that, Jesus saw her. Wow. Jesus saw her. I don't know if you understand what that really means. I'm not going to jump back up on the stage that way. I've only done Rachel Beattie's group once. And I was throwing up in the bushes all the time. I don't know if you understand what that actually means. Jesus saw her. He saw her. She was all bent up, all crippled down here. But he saw her. You know, sometimes we can go through life thinking like, God, do you even see me? God, do you even see what I'm going through right now? God, do you even understand what's happening in my life? You know, the the biggest lie from the devil is he wants you to feel like you're alone and he wants you to feel like you're doing life all alone. He wants you to feel like what you're dealing with right now is so unique that no one would understand, no one sees what's happening, but Jesus sees. That fills me with so much hope. I don't know about you, but Jesus sees every struggle that we face. Jesus sees every insignificant thing that takes place in our life and he sees all of those things that were happening and he saw this woman that was there. That's just something that just brings so much hope in every situation that we can kind of go through. And not only does he see her, the very next part of the verse says this, is that he calls her. You know, as as Lifehouse Church, we have uh, a mission statement from our pastor that simply says, God has called Lifehouse Church to be a large, Jesus-centered church, full of grace and truth, reaching and equipping all generations around the world. That's, That's what God has placed in our senior pastor's heart for this collective body of people. But as individuals, we also have a calling from God. Sometimes we equate calling to things that we're going to go and do somewhere. Maybe it's involving travel or occupation or, or jobs or doing things around the place or, you know, serving God, whether it's through ministry sense in terms of uh, what we do, uh, preaching, you know, running a ministry, that sort of thing. We equate it to what we do, but there's even more than that. You know, so the calling of God, Jesus said he not only sees her, but now he calls her. He says, you know, woman, you know, the the thing that you're facing right now, 
you know, you may not feel like you have uh, a clear vision for your future. You may feel like right now you're all bent up and crippled over and you can't see where you're headed and you can't see what's kind of going on in your life. But he's called her to live a life that's greater than that. You know, sometimes we kind of get into this thing where we can't really see what's up ahead and we feel like we want to kind of know everything and, and kind of get a sense of what the call of God is for our life. But the call of God, like I said, is more than just what we do. It's sometimes it's even who we are. Because what happens is that God hasn't called us just to be weak Christians. God has called us to be people who are strong. God has called us to be more than conquerors. God has called us to be the head and not the tail. God has called us to be above and not beneath. God has called us in every situation. God has called us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. God has called us to be all of those things. Regardless of what we do, that's what God has called us to do. Uh, to, called us to be. And there's this amazing verse in Romans chapter 11. It just simply says this, for the gifts and the call, uh, for God's gifts and His call can never be withdrawn. So whatever God's called you to, it doesn't matter what situation that you find yourself in, God has called you to be that or to do that. He doesn't withdraw that from your life. So in other words, He's seen this woman all crippled over. She has no ability to be able to stand up straight by herself and to be able to move forward with fresh vision, fresh fire, fresh, uh, fresh direction for her life. She's got none of that. She can't look straight ahead in her life. But Jesus says, hey, listen, I see you where you are right now. I see that you've been devastated by the enemy for 18 years. I see the, 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 what he's stolen from your life and what he's taken from your life. I see all of that. I've called you, woman, to be able to live a life that's greater than that. You don't have to settle for what you've had for these last 18 years. And he calls her to himself. And the same as what Jesus has done there, he's done with each and every one of us. You know, he could have gone quite easily and walked over to her. He could have walked up to her and healed her right where she, where she was. She didn't have to kind of push her way through all the legs of all the men to try and get to Jesus. She didn't have to try and struggle to kind of get from where she was to where Jesus was. He could have easily have walked up to her and said, hey, I'm going to pray with you now. You're going to be healed right now. He didn't do that. Instead, what he did is he calls her to himself. Sometimes when we're facing a situation, what we want to see is that we want the easy way out with no struggle. We, want, we feel like, God, you know, please just come and do this for me and then I'll go and do all these things for you. God, just, I just don't want the struggle. But you know what? Oftentimes in the struggle, it's the struggle that draws us closer to Jesus. That's what was happening in this woman's life as she stood there on the perimeter, as she struggled with each and every step, as she was bent over, for her to actually make one step to be able to draw closer to Jesus, it involved pain, it involved stretching, it involved discomfort, it involved all these things. But each, each time she took a step, she was like, hang on Jesus, I'm coming. It might take me a while, Jesus, but I'm coming. God, I've been like this for 18 years. I can just take one more step, Jesus, I'm coming. And each step that she took just put her closer and closer and closer to Jesus until finally she's standing at the very feet of Jesus. She's, she's at His feet and He's there and He reaches out and He touches her. In actual fact, He says these words to her. He says, woman, you are free. Written in red for all of us to read, Jesus declares that season that you've been walking through in your life right now has come to an end. Jesus, what He did is that He saw her he called her and then he restored her. He said, you're free. And that same Jesus that said that 2,000 years ago to that woman in that synagogue is the same Jesus that's here today. He sees you. He sees everything. He's called you. He's called you to live above what you're living right now. He's called you to live a life of victory. And he wants to restore what the enemy has stolen from your life. For some of you, it's dreams. He's taken dreams from your life. For some of you, it's promises that he gave concerning your children. That you were promised by God that your children would grow up in the house of God. And you're looking around now going, where are they, Lord? They don't seem to be anywhere near you. The enemy's tried to steal from your life. But Jesus today wants to restore all those things back to you. And I love this story. I love, that, I love that Jesus did this and did it as an example for us. You know, I, I, I look at this and I, I see my own life. And I remember when I was eight years old, I gave my heart to Jesus. And, you know, we had kind of grown up in the Catholic church, 
and my parents had separated. My dad, I was living with my dad and we were living up in Queensland and uh, we went along one day to this crazy church. Um, it was a very large church. It was a Pentecostal church. I'd never been to a church like that before. And they had drums. It was like people were doing crazy things. People would pray for people and they would get healed. I'd never seen that before in all my life. And people actually were happy. They looked like they wanted to be in church. I'd never seen that before in all my life. And there were so many people there and it wasn't Christmas and it wasn't Easter. It was so amazing. And it was my eight-year-old mind was just like, wow, this is so incredible. So that particular, we'd gone a couple Sundays and then my dad, one day after the preacher had preached, my dad put his hand up and he gave his heart to Jesus and he walked out the front, he said a prayer and he gave his heart to Jesus. So in the car on the way home that day, he was explaining to me what he did and why he did it and everything. I was saying, yeah, I think I wanna do that too. So that next Sunday when we were at church, the preacher was up there preaching and, and, and I was there and I put my hand up and dad leant over to me and said, do you want me to walk up the front with you? And I said, no, no, it's, it's cool, dad. I got this, it's all right, I can do this. And so eight year old me walks up in front of a couple thousand people and gives my heart to Jesus. And I tell you what, at eight years old, you think really, have you got a lot that, you know, I didn't have a drug habit at eight years old. I didn't have a lot of those sort of things going on in my life, but I still really had this sense that I need Jesus. And so I asked Jesus to come and be the Lord of my life. And uh, it was only a few weeks after that, that we were at a family camp up on, at Maruchidor and I got water baptised in the river up there. And then it was not too long after that, that I actually went on a kid's camp and I got baptised with the Holy Spirit. And so then I just started like, wow, this is just so awesome and so amazing that I just started, you know, at my lunch hours at school, I would set up everything like I'd seen that preacher do at the church that I went to. And I would just preach to the kids that were there at lunchtime. And I'd get them to put their hand up and come to the front and do all that sort of stuff as well. And I just did it because that's what you do, I guess, because that's what I'd seen happen. And, and it was just, I just got this sense that God was with me. Jesus saw me. I got this sense that He had a purpose for my life that I didn't know what it was. I couldn't articulate it at eight years old to be able to tell you this is God's plan and God's purpose for my life. I just had a sense that He was calling me and He had a call for my life to be something, somebody different to what I was at that stage. Fast forward 13 more years into the future. I'm 20 or so years old. Life hadn't turned out how I thought it would turn out. It's... It was, it was something that as I got to that point in my life and looked around, I was like, all these things that happened. At 13, I'd been molested. By the time I was 20, I'd slept with thousands of guys. And my life hadn't turned out the way that I thought that it was going to turn out. And I felt like I was doing life all alone. I felt a lot like that woman. I still had this desire to serve Jesus and follow Jesus but I felt so crippled because of the things that the devil had robbed from my life. I felt like that woman all bent over, no hope for the future, just trying to make it through life. All those dreams and all those thoughts and all those things that I had when as a young boy just went out the window. I just felt like, God, I know that you have those things there for me, but I just can't see how they can ever happen. Even, as a, even when I'm going through like my darkest days in those days, we would get people come to our church and I was the pastor's son. So it would be that as they came to the church, oftentimes they would get you up and have a prophetic word for your life and say, God's gonna do this with you and through you and everything else. And, and it was like, God was trying to, all this calling was going out. I was like, God, that's great, but I don't see how it's ever gonna happen because of look at all the stuff that I've been involved with. I felt so bent over, crippled up, that I didn't feel like I could even move forward because I couldn't see the horizon. All I could see was the ground and all I could see was the dirt in front of me. And God had to do something amazing in that time. And He brought some people into my life and, and one particular person He brought in and, and this person came and reminded me, hey Joseph, Jesus sees you. Jesus, Jesus sees you. He sees the struggles that you're going through. Even though you might feel like you're in a crowded room and no one even notices what's happening in your life, Jesus sees you. He's not waiting for you to be perfect before He asks you to come and follow Him. He's not asking you to, to get your life completely together. Otherwise, if we could do that, we wouldn't need Him. He's not asking you to do that. He's calling you. And there's a call on your life, Joseph, to be a man of God.
not to be bound and, and caught by the enemy, but there's a call on your life, Joseph, to follow after God and to be a man of God. And this person reminded me of this and, 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 brought it, and I was just like, all of a sudden hope starts to rise in my life again. And, and, and what happens is that through that struggle and through those times, I just started to draw closer to Jesus. And the closer that I got to Him, is like, Jesus, I'm coming. You know, it's taken me a long time to actually get here, Jesus, but I know there's lots of baggage around my life and there's been lots of struggles and I know you've made all these promises for my life and everything else, but God, I'm coming and I'm getting closer. God, I'm just gonna take another step, God. And right now I might feel all bound and and like I just can't do it again, but God, I'm in a lot of pain and everything else, but God, I'm gonna take another step and another step and another step. And each step I took in that struggle time drew me closer and closer to Jesus. And when I got to Jesus, what He did is He bent down and He whispered into my ear and He said, Joseph, you are free. Joseph, you are free. And that same Jesus that did that, come on. That same Jesus that did that to me all those years ago, is the same Jesus who did that to that woman 2,000 years ago, is the same Jesus who's here today and wants to come to you today and whisper into your ear to say, you know all those things that you've been struggling with, all those things where you feel like you're inadequate or you feel like you don't measure up or all those things where you feel like those struggles that you've been dealing with in life or where you've been robbed from or stolen from, Jesus whispers into your ear today and says, hey, you're free, Ammo, you're free, you're free, Lucy, you're free. You're free. Raylene, you're free. Holly, you're free. You're free. That same Jesus whispers those words into our ears. And I tell you what, it does so much good inside of us. And we know they're Jesus' words because they're written in red. And they're the same words that He spoke to that woman way back then. What He wants to do is He wants to give you the strength to be able to run again. There's some of us here, you've had these dreams that God has placed inside of your heart for businesses. You've had these dreams that God has placed inside your life for your family, for what that will look like, for what they will feel like, for what the call of God is on your life. You've had all these dreams that are there. You've felt so hindered and, and, and because of obstacles and circumstances, and everything else that's happened, God today wants to breathe fresh life into you so that you can start to run again with those things that He's placed around your life. There's so many businesses that are just waiting to be birthed because they're just sitting inside of you while you're bent over like that. And God's saying, no, today is the day to rise and to stand. There's so many things, dreams that God has, you know, there's preachers in this room who haven't even preached once yet because inside of them, they feel like they're so inadequate. They feel like, well, God, I could never do that. If you had asked me 12, 13 years ago that I would be up here doing this, I would be thinking, yeah, that would be the furthest thing that I would be doing, knowing all the things that had happened in my life. But it's only because Jesus has unlocked what He's unlocked and He's forgiven what He's forgiven and He's restored what He's restored that I can even get up here to do what I do. But the same as what's sitting in here, there's so many of you young guys here right now. You don't have to be perfect to come to Jesus. You don't have to be perfect to outwork some of the dreams that He's breathed inside of your heart. You've seen some of the stuff. You go, yeah, I wanna do that for God. I wanna be that sort of person for God. I wanna be someone who's bold and fearless and can get up there and be able to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I wanna be that person who does that. There's nothing stopping stopping us because it's God's will that we do that. It's God's will. He sees us. He's called us. He restores us simply by saying, hey, you're free. Now you got to do is stand up tall. That's what this woman did. As soon as, as soon as Jesus said those words, it was instantaneous, the Bible says. Instantly, she stood up straight. She stood up tall. Can you imagine what her life was like from that point forward? All of a sudden, she doesn't have to crawl anymore. All of a sudden, she could start to live a life like the people that she's seen all those years. She could start to live a life like that and just to be able to operate and function as a normal person. She was able to do that because Jesus touched her life and set her free. And that same Jesus wants to do that for each and every one of us and unlock some of those dreams and some of those desires and some of those callings that He's placed inside each and every one of us. In John 8 verse 32, it says this, again, written in red, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So if the Son sets you free, you are truly free indeed. That's Jesus' plan for each and every one of our lives. That's Jesus' plan for each and every one of our lives. He wants us to walk free. He wants us to walk in victory. He wants us to walk as overcomers in this world, not as defeated people who are just making it through. 
He has so much in store for each and every one of us, but we have to start to rise and be able to say, God, have your way. God, I know that you see me. I'm not cut off from everybody. God, I know that I'm not walking through something where, where I'm just alone in this, but God, you're with me every single step of the way. That's God's plan and that's God's purpose for each and every one of us. That's God's plan and that's God's purpose for each and every one of us. Oh,